Our scripture this morning comes from Luke's gospel, the 13th chapter, verses 6 through 9. Then Jesus told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to his gardener, See here for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? The gardener replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good, but if not, you can cut it down. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to to God. God. So I should begin with letting you know that the irony of preaching a sermon on enduring on my last Sunday before maternity leave is not lost on me, (laughs) though it was not originally planned to be that way. I love this parable, the parable of the barren fig tree. It's quick, it's often overlooked in the scheme of Luke's gospel, and more often than not, when we hear about fig trees in the Bible, the one that pops into our mind is Jesus cursing the fig tree because he went to find a fig out of season. The fig tree had none. Jesus curses it and it withers up. But this parable almost stands in contrast to that one. Instead of Jesus being frustrated at the lack of figs, it's a subtle nod to waiting and enduring. So the owner comes to his tree looking for fruit, finds none for the third year in a row. He's very frustrated. I guess he really, really wanted a fig. And he tells his gardener to cut it down. It's just wasting soil. But the gardener begs him to spare the tree. Wait one more year. One more. Let me dig down around it. Let me put manure on it. And if next year there's still no fruit, you can go ahead and cut it down. That's it. The whole parable. There's not a lot of commentary on this, and we don't know what happens to this fig tree. But a little bit of contextual research will tell you that it takes up to five years for a fig tree to reach maturity and bear fruit. So really, the vineyard owner could have been a little more patient. He could have waited a little bit longer. And yet, I think both of us, most of us, can understand both the perspective of the vineyard owner and the gardener. So I have a confession to make. I have a deep, deep longing to be able to grow fruit trees. It started when I was a child. We had a pear tree in our backyard, and it produced nothing but hard-as-rock pears that were incredibly bitter. No animals wanted to eat them, and year after year, I would go out with expectation and anticipation for a pear that was edible, and each year my hopes were dashed by these rock-hard little pears. We moved to another house, and this one had a persimmon tree in the backyard. And each year I would get excited that I would see the persimmons growing, I would go out, and as soon as they were just about ripe, Squirrels from all over the neighborhood would descend upon our backyard and eat them before I had a chance to pick one. And then after many years of living in apartments and parsonages, I finally have my own Meyer lemon tree in the front yard. It was a Christmas gift for my husband last year, and I am patiently waiting for its singular lemon to ripen. There's one little lemon growing, and I tend to that tree with unbelievable frequency. I've read copious amounts of information on how to make it the happiest and most productive little Meyer lemon tree that it can be. I bought special fertilizer. I water it on a pretty consistent schedule. I really love my tree. It's almost to the point where everyone makes fun of me for how much I go outside to check on it. Now I come by my desire to grow things honestly. It's hereditary. My mom's mom grew up in Ada, Oklahoma, on a farm in the Depression. Her family raised cattle and chickens. They grew corn and cotton and a smattering of other vegetables that her mother, my great-grandmother, would use to supplement their meals. They depended entirely on their land for their livelihood. And my grandmother's stories of her early childhood are still one of my most favorite things. And like her father, she can grow things anywhere. To say that she has a green thumb is an understatement. 
For as long as I can remember, no matter where she lived, and she's a nomad, she moves every three to five years, she always had a thriving garden. And at 86 years young, she still does. She loves growing fruit trees and flowers, and she always has a Meyer lemon tree, okra, and tomatoes. Junebug, that's my grandmother, can grow anything, anywhere. It's always a joy to see what's growing in her garden. She always has fresh vegetables when we come to visit, and she gets a kick out of sending her grandchildren home with whatever her garden has grown, whether it's lemons or kumquats or something else. For a while, she lived in a house in Fairhope, Alabama that had a big fig tree on its property. When she moved in, this fig tree was the saddest thing you have ever seen. It had gone through the ringer in the last couple of hurricanes, and it was pretty scraggly. It had torn branches and yellow sickly leaves. It looked like it would just fall over and die at any second. It was by far the worst looking thing she has ever had in her yard. The saddest tree I have ever seen. But Junebug refuses to cut down something that could bear fruit. I guess it's the child of the depression in her. She was determined to revive that sad, sad tree. And so she nurtured this tree back to health slowly over a few years. She bought special fertilizer. She watered it carefully. She made sure to cover it in the frost. She tended to that tree faithfully for a couple of years. And during those few years, it would produce three or four pathetic, shrivelly little figs. Not even the birds or the squirrels were interested in them. But the tree looked better. It was stronger. Its leaves were green again. It just wasn't yielding any fruit. But after one more year of meticulous care, this fig tree began to produce some serious figs. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Number one, you're making this up, and I'm not. And number two, I bet those were still pretty sad-looking figs. But oh no, this tree rained down figs, big, fat, juicy figs. So many figs that when my older sister and I went to visit her during fig harvesting time, the first thing she did when we got out of the car was to hand each of us a five-gallon bucket, and she said we couldn't come inside until they were full. There were hundreds and hundreds of figs. So my grandmother made preserves out of what she couldn't eat before they started rotting, and there were so many boxes of fig preserves that I returned to my dorm room freshman year with enough fig preserves to feed my entire hall. I put it on everything, toasts, pancakes, Eggo waffles, ice cream, you name it, I put figs on it. There were so many figs that even the birds and the squirrels got tired of eating them. I promise this is a true story. For years, visiting my grandmother meant picking up a jar of fig preserves out of her pantry on the way home, or depending on the season, grabbing a bucket and picking them so you were allowed to come inside and eat dinner. Junebug's patience with her fig tree makes me consider the gardener in the parable. Like Junebug, the gardener knew about plants and trees. He was familiar with the work and the patience needed to grow things. He knew that sometimes a little extra tender love and care was required to help a tree bear fruit. The gardener understood the work required to care for a garden and a vineyard. The owner of the vineyard was far less familiar with what the, with the work that was actually required. He financed the operation, and deep down he was a businessman, not a farmer. He was results-driven and eager for yields and profits. He'd waited three years already for this tree to do something. He was not about to wait any longer. There's a certain level of commitment required to bear fruit. It definitely requires a bit of patience. Three years was all the owner had in him, and yet the tree needed a little more time. The owner was done waiting, but the gardener was willing to do work. Waiting is hard. Waiting is even harder when things are unpleasant. Waiting and enduring without any reward or even the promise of reward is harder still. So consider what the gardener asks of the vineyard owner. One more year. Let me dig down around it and place manure by its roots. Let me tend to this tree just a little bit more. Let's wait it out just a little bit longer. This story can conjure up pretty vivid sights and smells. Manure is not the most pleasant material to work with. The gardener is asking this man 
to do some hard and unpleasant and taxing work. Just one more year, let me dig down deep. Let me give this tree something awful to help it grow. Let me, let me work for you and for this tree. How often in our lives do we wait for fruit to appear? How often do we wait for our, hand, our hard work to finally pay off? Or maybe we just wait to be rewarded even though we haven't done much. Still, most of us have checked off boxes. We've gone to school, we've gotten the certification or the degree, we've put in the time, we've shown that we're worth our work. We've struggled to get what we think we're owed only to be forced to wait another year, only to see no fruit appear, or at least not the fruit that we were expecting. We are a people of instant results. If I have blood work done, I want to know immediately what the centrifuge says. If I order something online and it doesn't come with free two-day shipping, it's not even worth it. If I send a text or an email, I want the person to reply within minutes. Seconds, really. We like instant results. We want things to work now and to be quick and easy and painless. Most of us love the temptation of just picking up groceries and not even having to go into the store. We like it and it's easy, but that is not life. One of my favorite books of the Bible is Ecclesiastes. It's not exactly a tale of sunshine and rainbows. Life is, as Quoheleth, the writer of Ecclesiastes tells us, is toil and work and vanity. It's doing what is set before us, not because we will gain anything, but it is because it is what it is. God sets before us life and it is put into motion and we are blessed to live it. We are enriched by the work we do and it is in our struggle and our toil that we are changed and transformed. It is the struggle and the hard work of life that allows us to bear fruit and to grow. Consider for a moment the most meaningful moments of your life or consider the moments that were most transformative. Chances are good that not all of them are beautiful and magical moments. Chances are good that if we were given the opportunity to relive them, we would say, maybe not. I wonder if any of you watched the Anderson Cooper interview with Stephen Colbert. Did anybody watch it? Right? So Anderson Cooper talks to Stephen Colbert about the death of his brothers and father when he was about 10. And Anderson Cooper reads back a quote that Stephen Colbert said about that event. He said, you said, I love the thing that I most wish had not happened. And then Anderson Cooper asked Stephen Colbert if he really believed it, if he really meant it. And Stephen Colbert says simply, yes. And then he goes on to add that it is a gift to exist. And with existence comes suffering. There's no escaping that. I don't want it to have happened. I want it to not have happened. But if you're grateful for life, which I think is a positive thing to do, and not everybody is, and I'm not always, but it's the positive thing to do, then you have to be grateful for all of it. You can't pick and choose what you are grateful for. Sit with that for a minute. We can't pick and choose what we are grateful for. Like Stephen Colbert and like many of you, I imagine that there are lots of things in your lives that you had wished had not happened. And yet we have to consider the whole. It's not single moments that make our lives, but the connectedness of those moments. Those moments that present us with opportunities for growth and transformation in all the seasons and experiences of our lives. It is not pleasant, but we grow through our suffering. It is in those unpleasant parts that we again gain awareness of the good parts. It is in our pain that we see growth, and it is in wallowing in that messiness of life that we mature. Colbert adds this about his own loss and grief and suffering. You get the awareness of other people's loss, which allows you to connect with that person, which allows you to love more deeply, 
and to understand what it's like to be a human being if it's true that all humans suffer. I hate that he said that because it's true. This time of suffering and waiting, of longing and pain, it's a time of growth. Growth that allows us to see one another in full humanity. Growth that allows us to change and mature and, yes, to bear fruit. And as Christians, that's what we are called to do, to bear fruit. And those fruits are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. These fruits are grown through struggles and failures, through suffering and pain. We often wish away the challenges and struggles of our lives. We seek to find ways to make our suffering less. It's a human thing to do. Pain is not pleasant. No one, if given a sign-up sheet for a life full of suffering, would say, yes, put me on the top of the list. Few people volunteer to endure hardship. We are intentional, intentional about making our lives easier. And yet, that does not always help us grow. The stories that compel us and inspire us are stories of people overcoming odds, of triumphing in the face of despair and struggle. We like stories of redemption. We want to be inspired by people who have done things that we didn't think were possible. And yet, if we're given our own insurmountable odds, more often than not, we quickly begin to look for an exit. Think of the vineyard owner. He's done waiting around. He's done with not getting what he thinks he's owed. He isn't willing to endure anymore. This tree is wasting good soil. But think too of the gardener, presented as a contrast to the owner, willing to do the tedious and unpleasant work of digging down deep to place manure on the roots of the tree, willing to wait it out another year, willing to put himself on the line to give this tree a chance. He knows that it should bear fruit. It should be worth the toil and the struggle. He is willing to wade in the muck, to struggle against the hard soil to dig down around it. He's willing to sacrifice his sweat and his time and his energy, not because there's a guarantee of fruit, but because he has hope in what could be. There are a lot of people who have hope in what could be that inspire us. Martin Luther King Jr., Vincent Harding, Rosa Parks and Nelson Mandela, Gandhi, Greta Thunberg, Dorothy Day, Malala, Mother Teresa, Harriet Tubman. These are people who suffered in the hopes of bearing fruit. People who endured even though they may not have seen what came of their labors. We have our own icons in the church. People like Lee Joyner, the first woman ordained in our annual conference, who endured much more than her fellow clergy so that she could be ordained and follow the call that God gave her. We have pastors like Phil Woodland, who became beloved not while he was calling out the need for racial reconciliation and integration, but only after most of us realized that he was right. Leaders like J.J. Warren and Amy DeLong and Bishop Karen Olivito who stand boldly for the rights of LGBTQIA people to be ordained and fully included in the church. They struggle and endure because they hope that the fruit will come. With struggle and pain comes change, and avoiding those times of challenge and grief rob us of the opportunity to grow. And in the midst of all of that, there is good news. God is with us in those moments. God is ever-present, offering to us love and grace, offering us perspective and opportunities to be grateful. God is present in our suffering, enduring it alongside us. While others told these people to abandon their causes, that things may never change, they endured. They believed in the promise of fruit. They believed that someday their endeavors would create change. And as we look back, most often they have. More often than not, more than what was anticipated has grown out of that time. Because when we endure for the sake of Christ, when we hold on to faith in the face of great suffering and at personal cost, when we hold on to our convictions despite the world telling us to let them go, 
God transforms us, God uses us, and God bears fruit in our lives. It's easy to just sit there, to say the work is too hard, to give up when it's taking too long to see growth. But God calls us to endure. Blessed are the persecuted. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who persevere for the sake of Christ. We are called to live in hope and faith. Will you pray with me? We ask today, O oh God, for those who have lost hope and for those who have never had it. Grant to us and to those we lift before you in our hearts a new and abiding vision of what you have done, what you are doing, and what you will do to save and redeem your people and indeed creation. Grant, O oh God, that all might see and believe and discover their purpose and the purpose of all that is and all that is yet to be. Amen.